Hello there. Here we are with issue 35. And uh, before we get into it, let's go ahead and bounce over and see what's going on with the data and the details for this issue. All right, so here we are with the details and the data for issue 35. <clears throat> we had one build video. We worked on framework and plating. Uh, total build time was 34 minutes and 26 seconds. Had a total of two captures. Total video capture time was 19 minutes and 26 seconds. And the total video time, uh, video total time was 20 minutes and 26 seconds. Seems a little, oh, right. So there's an extra minute at the beginning that adds to that. So here we go. Um, we added 14 screws this time and we used the primer black when we did the painting for the um the hull plating so we had two captures the first one was 17 minutes and uh, one second and the second one was two minutes and 25 seconds and we had 15 minutes of off-camera work for that and that gave us a total of 34 minutes and 26 seconds so if we come over here we're looking at we've had a total of 52 build videos, uh, 156 captures to so far. Our total build time or video time is 26 hours and 33 minutes. Total build time is 84 hours and 43 minutes. That's over a full two weeks worth of work if you're doing it as a job. Hmm. And uh, our average time is now 30 minutes and 38 seconds. Shortest video still set, uh, 15 minutes. And we've got 221 total screws now. So that breaks that down. So let's head back over and let's take a look at the actual uh, magazine this time. All right. Welcome back. So hopefully you guys are still enjoying that. Finding something useful from it. You know, all that kind of fun stuff. So here we are, we're going to talk about the Venator class destroyer. So as I mentioned uh, in my quick preview of this issue, when uh, uh, when I was doing the actual build portion, I mentioned that we had already kind of somewhat mentioned the Venator class. And so we're going to go take a little bit more of a deep dive into this and see what we can learn. So the Venator class Star Destroyer, properly known as the Republic Attack Cruiser, was of vital importance to the Grand Army of the Republic. These ships, designed to carry out a wide range of different mission profiles, became icons of the Clone Wars. So it was built in the, Co uh, the Kuwait Drive Yards. Its dimensions are uh, 1,137 meters long, 584 meters wide, and 268 meters tall. And that would probably include the, the conning towers there. Uh, its acceleration is 3000G, it's got a class 1 hyperdrive, crew is 7400, passengers are 2000, armament is 8 heavy heavy turbo lasers, 2 medium dual turbo lasers, 52 point defense laser cannons, 4 proton torpedoes, and 6 tractor beam projectors. This complement is 420 uh, starfighters, 24 uh, ATTE walkers, and 40 plus gunships, numerous additional shuttles, and it can carry 20,000 tons, and it carries 2,000 or two years worth of consumables, so you know foods and all that kind of stuff. So it's a versatile configuration um, uh, designed by the daughter of, or designed by Lyra Wessex, who is the daughter of Walix. Blissix, and uh, her double wedge design for the Venator would be the first of many triangular shaped capital ships by the KDY. It became known as the Republic Attack Cruiser, and it was one of the most powerful vessels in the Republic fleet, and it was armed with 60 weapon emplacements, uh, blah blah blah, we kind of went through all that. Uh, it's designed to be self-sufficient, and all that kind of fine stuff. So, uh, up here during the Clone Wars, the Republic Navy College adopted a new classification system for capital ships. 
which soon became the standard. The most controversial aspect was the use of the designation Star Destroyer. Purists complained that this was a Kuat Drive Yard's corporate brand, but the college noted that the commanders had already begun using it for large Republic war, uh, large Republic warships, and even the CIS ones. The Venator would emerge as the first KDY Star Destroyer, but more designs were already in development. So that's pretty important. Manning the Venator, uh, clone troopers made up the majority or the most of the Venator crew, but these ships often became the temporary home of Jedi generals of a Jedi's, Jedi general's army. Boy, I have a hard time reading right now. Which include the presence of high-ranked Republic naval officer, such as uh, Wolf. Let me get my change my glasses here. Wolf Yularen, uh, Barton One Coburn, or Niles Tennant. Many of these officers established a valuable working relationship with their Jedi generals and with a particular ship. So, uh, had a large central flight deck and enabled starfighters to be deployed swiftly and allowed them to leave as soon as the doors were opened. Although this procedure left the vessel rather vulnerable, this was compensated with large deflector shields near the entrance. Atmospheric containment shields protected both sides of the flight deck where pilots were briefed, maintenance was performed, and additional ships waited to be deployed. So, this red strip right here, let me hold that up. So this red strip right here, that would open up and kind of like a, you know, like a sliding door, and that's where all of the ships would take off and and land from. So it was very efficient as far as launching and and recovering ships of that of that kind. So uh, that was pretty cool. You would be very familiar with that layout if you saw Rebels. Uh, you don't see it in um, the uh, the Revenge of the Sith. It wasn't in there. So, um, but uh, you would definitely be familiar with it in if you watched Rebels. So, it became the emblem of the Clone Wars. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, while the prow was taken up by the flight deck, a Venator also carried docking bays on its side to enable quick connections with space stations, mooring towers, or large transports for transfer of equipment or troops. A smaller ventral bay was used primarily to receive visiting craft from influential military or political leaders. On the initiative of General Skywalker, some Venators installed SPHAT turbolasers near the area to augment their ventral firepower. Uh, characteristically outfitted with red markings in their proper arm, armada's emblem, the Venators became the common sight during the Clone Wars and emerged in the, on the victor side as the symbols of the deadly conflict. Their part during the Battle of Coruscant, when they formed a shield against General Grievous's invading fleet, will never be forgotten by the people of the capital, uh, galactic capital. The Imperial Tarkin Doctrine and the subsequent in introduction of Kuat's more Powerful Star Destroyers made the Venator nearly redundant during the reign of the Galactic Empire. However, Imperial Moffs did still use them in their private fleets, and they were also used at flight schools. Some Venators were still active while protecting the Sanctuary Pipeline leading to the indoor system when the second Star Destroyer was constructed. So the backstory, the triangular design of the attack cruiser is supposed to form a bridge between the look of the Republic's earlier dagger-shaped uh, uh, acclimator-class assault ships and the Imperial-class Star Destroyer used by the Galactic Empire. The name Star Destroyer was never used during filming, but it stuck due to the likeness of the Venator to the classic Star Wars design. A Venator is featured in the opening sequence of Repub uh, Revenge of the Sith with Ana when Anakin and Obi-Wan enter the battle over Coruscant and the low rumble the cruiser heard over that shot was actually the filter sound of Niagara Falls. At the end of the movie, the red color and the Republic markings of the cruiser were removed to show their inclusion in the Imperial Navy. So, uh, that's probably where you see the, uh, 
or Vader first goes out and you see him go out onto the bridge and there's Tarkin there and they're seeing the, the first kind of uh, steps of building the um, started or the the uh, Death Star. So yeah. Um, so there is that. The Pantranaki Arena. So I'm just going to kind of briefly go through this because it's, you know, uh, nothing terribly interesting in my opinion. Uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Don't say it's not, but, uh, I don't feel that it adds a lot that you didn't already know if you've seen the movies. So, uh, so basically this is where the Geonosians would basically take their prisoners and they would, uh, perform these, these fights and it basically is a way to kill them, but they wanted to basically do it and make a show out of it. So, uh, that's pretty much, uh, uh, so it talks about public executions and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, that's pretty much what its usage was. And, um, you know, so that there's that, uh, it was linked to underground tunnels, to the droid foundries and uh, droid storage chambers were also located nearby. The flat arena floor was simply made of packed sand and silt, useful for soaking up the blood of the Geonosians' victims. Around the arena, the lower walls uh, displayed the many ancient carvings depicted, depicting famous battles and events between a series of gates that opened to release a variety of predators from the enclosures below. So here's the arena beast that they used in uh, the Attack of the Clones. So although it is a form of crustacean and mainly live in water, the three-eyed non-sentient Ackley, which is this one, is amphibious and ventures on land to hunt, using its six deadly claws to spear or slice its prey. Their limbs are long, enabling them to strike with deadly force from a distance. The reek is a powerful, almost unstoppable quadruped with thick skin and huge horns. Native to Ulysia, subspecies are found on several planets and are all naturally brown. The red skin of those kept in for executions indicate that they have been eating, eaten, have eaten meat, a diet that makes the reek much more aggressive. The Nexu uh, is a feline predator native to the forest of Chalagana, bad-tempered and almost impossible to domesticate. They are trapped by daring hunters who know that Nexus are in demand for arena battles, where their ferocity is popular with spectators. So, basically, one of the things with uh, with this is uh, the people that wanted to get in the good graces of the Geonosians would capture different beasts and stuff, and then they would gift them to to uh, to the Geonosians, particularly uh, 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 their leader, which I'm trying to find his name. I don't see it here. Um, uh, Paka or something like that is his name. Um, if I happen to see it, I'll point it out. But um, so, yeah. Uh, Let's see if it talks about it in here. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Poggle the Lesser. So they'd gift him to him, and that would get him in the good graces, and he could use it in their their kind of arena thing there. So, um, And this obviously was the last battle in the arena, because then after that the Republic kind of took over and whatnot. Scale models. So this was rather interesting. Although a great deal of the action in Episode 2 was Created digitally, the movie also used elaborate sets and model backgrounds. It was decided to build the arena as a giant circular mo uh, model that would become that would come apart in 45 degree slices to enable it to be worked on and filmed for multiple crews at once. Uh, for many sequences, two camera crews shot the model arena at the same time, and for others, there were as many as three working simultaneously. To prove the concept, the model makers started by constructing a small sectional model measuring around 450 millimeters, but the finished structure built up to built 
up by using urethane foam, which gave a good representation of a rocky surface, was over 3 meters tall and 5 meters in diameter. That's pretty large. Uh, this equated to a scale of 135th, the most popular size for military modeling. However, much larger scale miniatures were made for close-ups uh, of the beast pins, uh, key sequences of, of the bank seating where the Jedi would appear among the crowds, and the royal box for which Poggle and Dooku watched the execution proceedings. These detailed miniatures were made to a scale of 1 8th, which was also used for some of the sequences showing the battle that spilled o spills over uh, to the desert outside the arena. So there you go. There's a little bit about the uh, Pataki, Pata, Patana, Petranaki Arena. <laughs> wow. Docking facilities. So this is pretty much going to talk about... Um, the generic docking facilities and all that kind of stuff but then it gets into the yt-1300 for example has a total of four docking rings and hatches which enable the ship to rendezvous with other vessels while in orbit or even on the move these were mainly designed with capital ships and space stations in mind however these universal standardized fixtures can be used with all manner of new and old space vessels they can also attach to transparent steel passenger gantries found at the luxury spaceports. It was because of this flexibility that the Millennium Falcon's docking rings and hatches more than proved their worth in the Rebellion era. As a successful uh, smuggler, Han Solo commonly chose to forego landing at a spaceport and conduct his business in remote parts of space. The sealed hatches of the port and starboard docking rings became Solo's preferred way to of transferring cargo to and from the ship out of the sight of his rivals or the preying eyes of the Imperial forces and their many spies. Docking with another ship or a fixed facility requires a careful approach matching the speed of the incoming ship to its target, followed by precise maneuvering to link up, although computers, uh, proximity sensors, and tractor beams help to ensure accurate docking. So this kind of shows uh, the different do uh, docking rings. So you have the one docking ring here, then you have the dorsal hatch, and this is this would be this dorsal hatch here that uh, Lando goes up through. And then there's this universal docking hatch, which is down below, where you could go in and out, and basically you'd have to climb down and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, on the YT-1300 passenger's cargo, um, direct access to central ring, both sides of the external magnetic couplings and hermetic uh, hermetic seals to link the docking rings to other starships, but the airlock attached to the port docking ring is much smaller than its starboard equivalent due to its position close to the dorsal hatch. This here, so this area is smaller. Uh, this hatch and its ventral equivalent are often ignored as it is much easier to move cargo in a straight line than to uh, than it is to transfer up or down via small openings in the ceiling or floor. However, Luke Skywalker owed his life uh, to the foresight of Krillian uh, Engineering Corporation's engineers who decided to fit the hatch uh, into the port corridor. This allowed the Falcon's former owner, blah, 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 to find Luke. So, yeah, so that's pretty important. Um, the universal hatch was actually designed for hookups with small vessels with restricted hatchways, but its fittings were standardized to allow them to lock in onto most starships or spaceports docking rings and tubes. However, Solo Harley used the smaller hatches, and it's doubtful whether they would be wide enough to permit a Wookiee to pass through. That's probably quite true. So a little behind-the-scenes action here. In the original release of The Empire Strikes Back, Lando Calrissian appears on top of the Falcon just before the exhausted Luke falls from the weather vane under Cloud City, and the next shots show Lando bringing Luke down into the ship. This scene was originally altered for the special edition because it looked as if Lando had gone through the top hatch twice. In the first clip, seen from inside the ship, Lando appeared to 
uh, exit from the top of the ship as soon as the hatch opened, but the next shot from an exterior point of view showed the hatch opening before Lando came up through it. For the special edition, an extra external airlock was added. Also, looking from the inside, both hatches have to open before Lando can leave the ship, and cut to the exterior now blends in smoothly with the addition. A series of blue screen shots that never appeared in the movie showed Lando on top of the Falcon and assisting Luke to the hatch. In these, Lando appears to be wearing the lifeline he hooked onto the ship on his way out of the top hatch. So, for those that remember, uh, that is very true the way the original was when that first one opens up, and it's basically just a, a kind of an issue with the editing. So they they show it open, and then you can actually see like light and everything from outside. Whereas then they cut and they show the hatch again open up. So it's it's like you almost went back in time to see it. Um, so what they did in the special edition was uh, they made a hatch here, and then they made a hatch up there. So you had to go through both. And so that did actually help quite a bit. It was one of the the one of the additions to the special features that was quite effective. So that concludes the uh, breakdown of issue 35. And um, next time we'll be looking at issue 36. I'm guessing that we're going to be working on these, but uh, we'll get started on those uh, quite soon. And I want to apologize for getting out the video late i actually thought i had uploaded it and realized i hadn't uh, very late so um, we'll get that uploaded uh, this next one uploaded on time and this uh, issue will actually be uh, this video will actually be late um, because i want to give a day or two in between the two videos from the build video and then this breakdown video so um, but we'll get the next build video out on the appropriate date. So that's it for issue 35. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope you're enjoying this. And I want to say may the force be with you always.